All right. I want to welcome all of you to this Polar Connect event. We're really excited um, to be uh, have the research team um, that has been doing work with jellyfish out in the Bering Sea. They are currently actually in port at Dutch Harbor in uh, the community of Unalaska down in the Aleutian chain of Alaska. Um, we will be hearing from our Polar Trek teacher, Lee Tivan, and we'll hear from the researcher, Mary Beth Becker. Um, it is August 3rd, 2017. I am Janet Warburton. I will be um, help facilitating this presentation, and uh, Judy Bonstock with uh, Arcus is also online. Um, and we will be um, just kind of running the slides and showing you uh, what is going on with the research. We will turn this over to Lee and Mary Beth in just a little bit. I have a few things that I wanted to go over that um, are related to the Polar Trek program, and let's give you a little bit of background. First is this uh, Adobe Connect platform that we're using. Lee and Mary Beth do not see anything that is happening online today. They were only able to join by phone. So any uh, questions or comments and things that get relayed in the chat area, we will relay to them. Um, but if you've joined us um, virtually, you will be able to see the slides that they've sent us as well as the chat going on, a list of participants, and um, uh, hopefully all of that will work for you. We won't be doing any webcams today because um, that that piece of equipment is uh, not working for this particular um, event. Um, let's see. In the meantime, um, like I said, you can all introduce yourself in the chat area below. So why is Lee out in the Bering Sea and working with Mary Beth? Uh, she is part of the Polar Trek program, and it's a funded program from the National Science Foundation. Um, we've been um, placing teachers out in the polar regions with researchers for over a decade now. Um, the whole program is run by a non not-for-profit company that's primarily based in Fairbanks, Alaska, called the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States. And we work with scientists around the polar regions, communities as well, and um, just try to get people to get their science out to the public. And Polar Trek is just one of the many things that Arcus does, but we love it because it involves teachers, it involves students, and it involves scientists. So we're really excited to have Lee and Mary Beth be part of our program. And we have a lot of teachers that are currently going um, to Arctic field locations, which we'll share with you at the end of this presentation. But um, Lee is just one of 12 this year that is headed out into the field. So with that, Lee, I'm going to turn this over to you. I'm on your title slide. Meet our team is going on. And um, in the meantime, uh, I was just going to tell you, let's see. People are saying hi, and um, we will uh, relay all of that information at the end of the um, session. And if there's any questions that come up during the um, presentation, um, I'll interject. And uh, just a reminder, cue me when you need me to change slides. OK. Greetings from Dutch Harbor, everybody. Um, this, you're looking at a picture of the day and night crews of our team. Um, very, very wonderful people. Um, everyone works really well together. And you're seeing this picture in very calm seas. Next. Okay. okay. And um, some of you might be asking, especially those of you who have been in the Bay lately, why study jellyfish? Well, recently, um, there have been some strange events with jellyfish. There have been blooms. And, and we're trying to figure out what causes these blooms, these big outbreaks of jellyfish. Um, some of these blooms um, could have come from maybe overfishing. Um, maybe there are invasive species. Um, maybe there's runoff, which puts a lot of nitrogen in the, in the sea, and that might cause um, an, an, a bloom of jellyfish. And some blooms just might be natural. So 
Next, please. So this is the jellyfish that we've been studying, Chrysera melanaster, or the northern sea nettle. And uh, those of you who live by the bay know that we have a relative of this in our bay. Um, the bell of this uh, medusa can be pretty large sometimes. And um, it, it is a voracious feeder. It will compete with fish larvae or, or eat fish larvae. And it eats fish eggs, zooplankton, as well as other jellies. Next, please. And this is the goal of the research. Um, to, if, we, if we get a handle on the population changes, like why there's a bloom one year or one season and not one another, um, and, we, and if we can measure the rate of growth within the season, we can put that information in a model that will allow scientists to predict you know, how, what will happen with uh, jellyfish as a result of changing ocean temperatures and maybe um, fishing practices. And next, please. And this is how um, we're studying jellyfish using technology. Um, you see the large machine that goes, it's, um, it's not uh, free floating in the ocean, it's attached to the ship and it gets lowered down through this. And that's, that allows us to see um, small plankton and um, jellyfish in their younger stages. And then there's sonar, which, yeah, up on top, which um, gives observations of mature jellyfish as well as fish. Now, one thing that um, Mary Beth and I have worked on during the day shift is the last one, toenet. We have been using plankton nets of different sizes to catch jellyfish, measure them, get the volume, and just look at uh, what else is in the net. Next, please. Hi, this is Mary Beth, a researcher. Um, it's uh, always nice to show this figure to people who are just learning about jellyfish because it's often not understood that they have uh, this, this stage, this life stage that attaches to nearby, to, to rocks or shells. So that is the, up in your upper left-hand corner of this slide. You can see that they, part of the life cycle for jellyfish um, is that they have a polyp that is attached to some hard substrate. These are very, very small, something on the order of, um, you know, just a, you know, half or a quarter of an inch in tall. So they're very hard to study. We're out here looking for, and you can see that the there's a on the very left-hand side of that polyp uh, attached to the rock. You can see that it, as the polyp grows, it creates these little disks, and each one of those disks will form into a new medusa or to a new jellyfish. And so you can see down that red sort of star-looking thing. It's called an aphyra. That's a, uh, a very young medusae, and that will grow up into a larger medusae within the order of um, days to weeks. And it's this part of the life cycle that Zubiz is uh, able to sample and able to observe. So that's one of the things we're out here looking for are these very young age classes, or very, very young jellyfish, and that Zubiz helps us get that information. And then if you come around to the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see the larger jellyfish. These are the things that we will come in contact with if we're walking along the beach or swimming. These are larger, and so Zubiz is not able to effectively see them. So this is how we're using the sonar, which is able to look at a much larger area of water, and we can, um, we can see the jellyfish showing up when, when they're big on the sonar. And then these large jellyfish, just to complete the life cycle, these large jellyfish, um, they release larvae into the water column. And these, these larvae then settle back down to the rocks and develop into a polyp stage once again. How Next long does that down. whole life cycle, hold on a second. Um, how long does that uh, yep, whole life cycle it. take? 
Yeah, how long does that whole life cycle take place? Yeah, that's a very good question. In uh, temperate and subarctic areas, so we're, we're in a subarctic area right now, we think that it's a, um, it, so we think that the polyps start uh, releasing their medusae in the springtime. And then uh, over the course of uh, probably, you know, several weeks to months, they grow up into that mature um, uh, medusa stage. And then it settles, that the, the larva, larva will settle in the fall to become a polyp. And those polyps will just keep keep living through the winter time. So it's a, it's a, it's about a year. And then we had another that question. Uh, yeah, and we had another question from Ann. What depths are these uh, things found out? So I guess maybe the each polyps. stage of the life, yeah, or each stage of the life cycle. Yeah, the, the polyps are notoriously hard to find in all systems. We don't know the depth that the polyps um, reside. Uh, the, the, however, we will know after after we process the data from this cruise where the where the jellyfish are. They're kind of in the we, we, so our preliminary observations show that they're in the middle of the water column here, which is at about 100 feet in depth. Okay. Um, all right, I think, uh, go ahead. Okay, and what you're looking at here is an image from Zuvis. Um, Zuvis is capable of imaging small plankton and uh, very immature um, medusa. And this is a tinafore. Up oh, next. So just to be clear, the, the image on the right is from Zuviz, and the image on the left is a live picture that's taken, you know, with a regular camera. So you can see that, um, you know, very high resolution, clear picture, so we can, you know, easily identify uh, things that, that are in the water column as we've seen with the ship. Here's another picture from Zuviz, the black and white is the image that we get from Zuviz. And in the upper uh, left-hand corner, uh, we got a nice image of um, krill, which is a shrimp-like creature that uh, whales and, um, and also jellyfish will eat the, the young form of, this, uh, of the krill. We're also getting very nice pictures on the right there of copepods. Copepods are also a very important zooplankton group up here. And uh, these are prey for um, uh, for fish and also jellyfish. And this is an image from the Arif sonar. And you can see um, you can see in the upper in the upper part of it two yeah um, you can see two mature jellyfish. You can just make out the bells and then the very long tentacles. Yeah. Next. Okay. Uh, uh, how long is that? Like, what? what is that? Um, can you kind of give us, uh, I guess, some uh, length, width, and something so we know what we're at sure. scale? That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> What's the scale? <laughs> sure. Yeah, good question. So the the bell on this one is probably about ten inches across, and I think the uh, the tentacles are you know probably on the on the order of uh, three feet or more. And what's all the other stuff that's in the that you see below them? All the dots are those other critters, or is that just the uh, you know part of the water? One second, the, uh, yeah. the the sonar expert just walked into the room. Cool. This is this is Ben Bender. Hi, how you doing? Thanks. Uh, Hi, you guys ben. Are checking out the air data right now. So, uh, what was your question exactly? They asked what this is down here. Oh, okay, so so this image shows the Aris, the acoustic imaging system, looking down towards the bottom and watching. I believe this was an image of two 
jellies in the Chesapeake Bay. And what you're seeing on the bottom there is actually the bottom itself. That would be a sandy or rocky, muddy bottom. Uh, and the reason it shows up in the way that it does is because the iris is actually imaging at an angle rather than straight down. So the near field of the sonar, about halfway up the frame, is where the image, the sonar actually begins to graze the bottom. And then as you go farther down the image, that's farther away and farther across the bottom. Mm -hmm. Oh, I guess I see that now. So, so the uh, the numbers that run along this are also the depth, the depth in meters or feet or inches or what's the it's scale on the side? Range. It's actually range that, from the uh, sonar. Uh, it actually begins at looks like 1.3 meters here and extends out to around seven, I guess, probably. Um, so okay. that's totally adjustable, but yeah, so it's range from the imaging system. We've all actually right. got a pretty good model. I've got a visualization of how this all works that I could give you, Great. make it a little easier to understand the grazing angle and the distance to the bottom. Okay. Yeah, that'd be cool. Give that to uh, Lee at some point and she can share that with us. Yeah. Okay. I can do that. I have it with me. Thank I'll you. Do that. All right. Thanks, Ben. Yep. Thanks. All right. Um, yeah, and yeah, well we have you, Mary Beth. There's some questions that came up uh before that, um, that I wanna get to and I don't wanna lose. So from Jillian, is there any research on how okay. jellyfish will how jellyfish will respond to ocean acidification? There's a there are some studies being done right now, very few, but uh, uh, from what I can recall, there was, they, in, in the experiments that, that were run, there was no uh, large effect of acidification. Now, you know, like I said, only a couple of studies have been done, so there's a lot more that we, that the researchers need to look at in order to really effectively answer that question. So, for example, I think they only looked at adult stages. I mean, you know, or you know, the polyp stage would have to be um, tested. The larval stages. So there's uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Uh, from Anne, we have a question. You're studying jellyfish in what I assume are cool uh, cool waters. Will your research also apply to jellies in warmer waters? Uh, well, um, so each species of jellyfish responds uh, in their own way to physical things like temperature. Um, so, it, and that's you know, it, it's another question. I think where the uh, the person is going with this question is like, what's happening as waters warm? And I can say, just like with the acidification question, there have been some studies done. Uh, to see what happens to especially polyps, uh, you know, when you have warming water. And, and uh, often warmer water for some species does mean that their production of the medusae is, uh, is increased. Uh, but uh, there have been some other studies that show that some jellyfish actually prefer cooler temperatures. So uh, you, I, I feel that you have to really look at each species independently uh, using, you know, experimental uh, procedures and also field exper you know, field, field op observations to really get at that question of what may happen to jellyfish populations as our water watchers warm. Okay. All right. Um, we'll turn it back to you guys to uh, keep going on. So I think you have another slide. Um, what's next? Is that where we're at? Okay, um, Mary Beth is bringing uh, the preserved samples, and in her lab at Yale, they're, they're going to identify and count them. And with that information, um, the species abundance can be measured at each station. And um, the Zuvis images are also going to be used to kind of compare, you know, like um, do, the, do the live samples match up with the images? Thanks. 
Any questions about that before we talk about life aboard the uh, Oceana? Uh, no, not at the moment. Okay, well, we're on the slide, life aboard the Oceana. And uh, as I mentioned before, this has been a wonderful crew, wonderful science team. Um, there's, you know, there's some downtime in between each station. And um, as you can see, there are lots of zombie films playing. Um, <laughs> We have a very nice galley or dining room area. And I spent most of my time on this cruise with Mary Beth in the wet lab, where we uh, looked at samples. Next. And this is where uh, Janet and Judy and Joette have been putting my journals um, on the Polar Trek website. So. Please look at those journals, ask questions. And I, you know, I just want to say that I think Lee did a great job going around to all people on the ship um, and you know, getting to know how, how the work is done behind the scenes, uh, down in the engine room, and also up on deck with the sampling. So they're very interesting posts, and I encourage you all to look at them. Yeah, they've been great journals. Um, we do have a question from Ann. She wants to know who does the cooking. Oh, <laughs> Teresa McMartin. She is. Is she here? She is. She's right here. <laughs> Teresa McMartin is the wonderful, wonderful um, chief steward, our cook. Do you want to say hello to everybody? Hello. <laughs> hello. <laughs> Perfect timing. <laughs> Yeah. The food has been great. And Teresa has been keeping us very well fed and happy. Yes. And she, I want, one day I want her to write a book about all her travels. She's been doing this for the past 15 years. And she yes. has many, many good stories. So, so look for a book one day by Teresa McMartin. And look, and look for your, 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 your post. And the post. Look at the post about her. Um, she was in a Polar Profile yesterday. Excellent. We will definitely read up about her. Yeah, it could be like the cook at sea or view from the sea or something. Fun. Um, so let's see. There was another question that came up. Um, uh, let's see. How many people are on the ship? Ooh, all total? So eight on the science team. Mm -hmm. Brandon, how many ships are there? So eight science crew and 13 ship's crew. Wow. Okay. Um, and then there was a question about, um, let's see, where'd that one go? Um, let's see, sorry. How are the seas? Have you experienced any seasickness? Yes. <laughs> Just the first day. <laughs> And then I put on a patch. I put on a patch maybe within an hour of the first day, and then I, I slept, and I felt fine the next day. Very good. Um, yeah, we, we had the and bad luck of our first day being pretty rough. Yeah, I could imagine. Um, how about, let's see, what was the other one? Is there more than one research crew on the Oceana? Right now, no. It's only this uh, jellyfish project, um, and that's quite nice. So we can um, we have full control um, of where we go with the ship, uh, and as long as we're we're asking to go in a place that's safe, um, and, you know, the captain will will let us know if we can go in an area, then we can go sample that area. But this is uh, only this science crew on this ship. Uh, there are. You know, uh, in, in some cases, you may be sharing uh, the ship with another science crew, and then you have to work together to share the time. But in this case, uh, we're the only science crew on this ship. Okay, and another question from Anne. How long are you out at a time? Okay. Uh, so we went out. We started the cruise on Friday, uh, and we just got back to port today, this morning. 
for this time around. Um, and I don't know, was your work that you did earlier in the summer the same thing, or was it slightly different? It was very much the same. We were out uh, for about a week, and we did the same cruise track. Uh, we left Dutch Harbor, uh, went to the northeast along the Alaska Peninsula, and then uh, turned up into the middle shelf of the Bering Sea, and then back down toward D Dutch Harbor. So we, we've done a, a rectangle. And perhaps that's something we can put our, um, our cruise track um, up on your website. Yeah, so I guess, can you kind of back up, uh, Mary Beth, and tell us a little bit, so uh, how long is your overall research project? Are you studying this just one year or many years? And how many times in a year do you go out sampling? Sure. We have a, um, a, uh, a grant from National Science Foundation for three years. And it includes two years of field work. And then in each year of field work, we have two cruises. Which, um, and each is uh, one one week long. So we were out here in uh, late May for a week, and now we're back here um, for a week now in late July and early August. We'll repeat that uh, two cruises next year as well. And then in the the last year, we're just uh, supported still by NSF, but to we'll be working up all the data and getting it ready for publication. Okay, cool. All right, uh, there are some other questions that came up while I was asking that. Um, let's see, do you change your planned route at all? Uh, yes, we, we do, and that kind of goes back to, you know, are you the only group on the, uh, on the ship? We have the flexibility to do that, and we, we did do that to some extent. We, did, we dropped a few stations. Uh, because we were uh, worried about running out of, uh, of time. We need to get back to Dutch Harbor in a timely fashion because the Oceanus has to get on to, a, uh, to their next cruise. And so we can't, you know, we have to make sure we get back into Dutch Harbor at the right time for them. So we did, in this case, drop a few stations. Uh, but we basically stayed on our course. We just uh, had to speed it up a little bit. Okay. Well, that relates to this next question from Jennifer. Is the ship only used for scientific expeditions? Uh, yes. OK. Um, is, and are they just in the Arctic, or do they go other places in the world? They go all over the place. Um, Brandon, you want to chime in? Where does this ship go? Oh, uh, yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, this is Brandon, the Marine Technician. And we, our functional range is, uh, our home is in Newport in Oregon. And we can go as far south as mainland Mexico, all the way across to Hawaii, and then up to Alaska and back down. So the ship can be out for 30 days uh, fuel-wise without having to stop in. But typically, we're out for two to three weeks. Oh, yeah, yeah. Any okay. other questions? Uh, oh, yeah. We got lots more questions here. Uh, thanks, Brandon. Um, oh, <laughs> and and uh, Anne wants to know, what is the temperature of the water? And the second piece of her question, is there a commercial value attached to jellyfish? Um, our water temperature has been between uh, 8 and 10 Celsius. Um, so you have someone have to do the quick, uh, what, low 50s. Thank you, Brandon. Low 50s. So about the same as our air temperature. Um, the commercial value of jellyfish, there is a fishery on jellyfish um, that's been uh, going on for decades now. Uh, they are uh, collected for food. Um, not every species is, is, uh, is considered edible. Um, the uh, the kind of jellyfish that is considered edible is a, usually rhizostome jellies, where they have a little bit more tissue um, that can be then dried and preserved and used in jellyfish salad. Um, so you may have seen that um, on the menu um, at various Asian uh, restaurants. I, I will often look for it, and it's, it's often there. 
I have a question. Um, is there a, uh, a similar uh, species or a southern sea nettle, and um, and or are there um, similar types of jellyfish found down in Antarctica waters? I'm not aware if there's Chrysura down in Antarctic. I mean, there are other jellies. Um, I have not worked down in the Antarctic, so I don't have a very good uh, answer for your question. OK. I was just curious, since they call it the northern sea nettle, if it had something, <laughs> a relative down there. Yeah, there, yeah, there is a. Uh, I think there, there, that name probably came from there's another species that uh, is common off of the west coast of the US. Um, it's Chrysura fusescens, um, and that, I think maybe maybe that's where the northern sea nettle comes from, and it's in relative to the one that occurs off of the uh, continental U.S. Um, another question. So this, Are this you species. Um, oh, oh, sorry. One Go second, ahead. though. This species does occur. This this species we're studying does occur into the Arctic. I know that for sure. Oh, okay. Um, uh, are you seeing booms in populations of man o' wars or other species? Uh, we have not seen any man o' wars or cyclonophores uh, on this survey, but we are seeing other species. Um, there's the crystal jelly we've been getting a lot of, or aquaria. Um, what else have we been getting? Lots Aurelia. of different, yeah, Aurelia, the moon jelly we've also gotten, uh, and lots of different uh, beautiful hydromedusae. Okay. Let me see if there's any other questions from people. Any, anybody else have uh, things that they want to ask here? Um, let's see. Oh, good question. Does anyone have a question? Well, that's pretty exciting. Well, uh, we're letting people think, and uh, if they will wait a moment to see if anybody has any additional questions. Um, I know I was asking before everybody joined what your plans are, but um, would one of you like to recap what your next steps and what you're doing today and um, what we should expect from you in the next couple of days? And Well, I know that I'm going to be helping pack up the lab equipment, um, and we're going to move it to storage. Mm -hmm. Those are my plans for the day. Same, <laughs> same for me. Um, I'll get back. Um, I'll get back to uh, New Haven on New Haven, Connecticut, on Saturday. Um, have a couple of days rest, and then uh, Hung Sheng, who's the uh, the PI, also on this project, uh, and I are starting to work on another grant to study jellyfish um, for the future. So. Um, you know, we, we're collecting data now for this project, but we're always looking ahead uh, for the next, um, you know, grant that we can try to try to obtain so we can keep our studies going. Yeah, how long does it take you to uh, do all the counts and look at all those samples? Like, what's that process look like when you get back to the lab? Yeah, that, I mean, that's going to take a while. Um, I mean, on this cruise, we have 30 samples. Uh, on the previous cruise, we have about this about the same. Um, so that could, that's what we'll be you know doing with the help of students um, during the winter months. And uh, it's kind of hard to go through many in a day. So we you know it's uh, it's kind of tedious work. So we have to kind of spread it out. Um, you know, but you know if we did one sample a day, every other day, you know we would we would get through that you know over the winter months. Um, and be, you know, we'll have some good information by next spring when we're getting ready to come back out again. Okay. Um, I happen to have the team a picture up, and somebody is asking, um, can you tell us what every one of the crew does, or at least everybody in that um, picture of your MISA team? You can maybe say who they are and tell us what each one does, and I can okay. use a little arrow to All right. go through. Um, now, that would be great. Um, this, just to be clear, this is the science team. Uh, okay. And yep. as uh, Lee mentioned, this is both both day and night crews together. 
Um, normally, we're working four people during day, four people during night. But here's one of the rare times where we're all together, so we got a nice group photo. Uh, going left to right, I'll start with the tallest person on our team, uh, Ben Binder. And you uh, heard from him just a few moments ago. He's um, an expert on using sonar and acoustics to, uh, to measure uh, fish and jellyfish in the water column. He's from uh, Florida International University. He's a PhD student who's getting ready to finish up. He's great, easygoing, uh, very smart guy, uh, great to work with. Next in the green hat is Jamie Ivory. She is a, um, she's a technician at Oregon State University. She has a lot of seagoing experience. Uh, she's been uh, in the Antarctic. Uh, she's been you know, uh, just all over. And she's, uh, as you can see, very smiley and uh, very willing to always be right there ready to go. So she's been helping uh, at night with the, with the net samples and deployment of our instruments. Uh, then you have Lee in the background, and you know what, what Lee is up to. Next uh, in the hat and orange pants, that is John Widmer. And he also has a lot of experience, just like Ben, with the sonar. Uh, and so they've been working um, at opposite shifts uh, to make sure we get good information from our sonar equipment. Next. Um, Behind, uh, or yeah, just just next uh, after John is Hung Shang B. He is my uh, collaborator on this project. He's actually the lead PI, lead principal investigator. Um, he has um, expertise in zooplankton, but also in uh, development of new technologies uh, to uh, to measure zooplankton uh, with the ZooViz scope, as as we described earlier. Uh, just next and below Hung Shang is Suzanne, and Suzanne is uh, Hung Shang's uh, student, PhD student. So she's uh, she's getting good experience out here, uh, but she also her her thesis though will probably um, take place mostly in Chesapeake Bay. Um, they're both from the University of Maryland um, Chesapeake uh, Biological Laboratory. Another tall person uh, in the back there is. Stuart Cook. Uh, Stuart Cook is a research specialist uh, who is uh, helping us um, with our instruments. He is one of the uh, uh, creators and designers of our ZooViz system. Uh, so it was great that he could come out with us because when, when we need to troubleshoot uh, ZooViz, we can go right to the expert. Um, so he can, he can help us with that. Uh, and then there's me uh, on, the, uh, on the other side of Stuart. All right, thank you. Yeah, I should have had to do that earlier. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's me too. Yeah, sorry have, about that. Uh, have Zuba's, uh creator there as well. I'm sure that um, people are interested in that whole piece of science as well. Um, so yeah, uh, and I think uh, Lee, Lee did a Lee did a profile on Stuart, so you can read about. Uh, he's a very interesting story of, and about his. Uh, his experiences developing uh, this instrument. Yeah, yeah. I love uh, learning how the uh, research instrumentation gets developed and, and then gets applied. It's pretty exciting, exciting stuff. Um, I don't see any other questions and here. I think another but, thing that's um, interesting, go ahead. Go ahead. I want to point out another interesting thing about this uh, picture. Can you see how we're all kind of standing pretty spread leg there? That's that's the typical at sea stance out here. So mm -hmm. you're just ready, you know, to move with the ship at all times. <laughs> yeah, you're you're ready. Balancing act is called. You're all mm -hmm. doing your Pilates. Um, all right. I don't see anything else. Uh, we do want to say uh, thank you. It looks like. Oh, Anne, are you trying to talk no. to the microphone? No. I heard you. <laughs> it's all right. Um, uh, we do want to say uh, thank you to Lee and Mary Beth and everybody else that managed to pop in um, for this event. Uh, we will um, be archiving it and um, sending it out uh, to everybody that registered as well as posting on the website. 
And I uh, just want to say thank you for joining us today, and it was great to hear more about the science. Thank you to everybody for joining us, and thank you, Janet and Judy, for setting it up. Yes, thank you. Yeah, no worries. Well, we hope you have a great day um, unpacking and uh, getting your land legs back, and uh, we look forward to more journals from Lee and hearing how getting off the ship and going home works out for you. Hopefully very smoothly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we have, so just so you know,